Hello and welcome to Chillers and Thrillers, the paranormal podcast where I read true stories of people's encounters with the strange and unexplained. No comedy, gore, or skepticism, only 100% true spooky tales. In the aftermath of the Civil War, a spiritual craze swept across America, one which had already been fairly popular in Europe. One of the inventions that came out of this craze was the Ouija board. In North America, the Ouija board has a particularly fascinating history, going from being a spirit board to a parlor game to what would be considered a toy created in mass by Hasbro. However, the idea of speaking to the dead and contacting our loved ones has long captivated the imagination of those seeking a connection with the other side. But are the beings contacting us through these methods actually spirits of loved ones? Or are they something more sinister, taking the open line of communication as an opportunity to invade our lives? In this episode, we're going to hear these stories of people who came in contact through Ouija boards and spirit boards. So turn down the lights, get comfortable, and listen in. Q, submitted by user Riotous Tripod. In the interest of full disclosure, I suppose I should start by saying that I am an absolute 100% believer in ghosts. I've seen and heard too many things to be left with any doubt. One of my earliest memories is seeing what I now believe to be the ghost of a Confederate soldier in my grandparents' home. But that, however terrifying may have been for three-year-old me, doesn't come close to making the list of the scariest moments of my life. I was intensely interested in the paranormal from early childhood. Even in elementary school, I devoured every book on ghosts, haunting, and psychic phenomena. As I grew up, I had several experiences I simply couldn't and still can't explain. In my late teens and early 20s, I discovered that many of my friends shared my interest, and quite a few had had experiences of their own. It wasn't long before we had acquired tape recorders, cameras, and a drive to investigate anywhere we thought had even a remote chance of harboring any sort of haunting activity. We had some astonishing successes, captured some of the best EVP I've ever heard, and got more and more adventurous as time went on. Eventually, as was bound to happen, one of us, we'll call him Brandon, decided we were missing one critical piece of equipment, a Ouija board. I wish I could say I tried to warn Brandon off of this thing from the start, but I'd be a liar if I did. I was a little uneasy about it and found that whenever my hands were on the planchette, we didn't seem to get anything. But as soon as my hands were off, it seemed to come alive. I still don't know why this should have been, but I chalked it up to some kind of mental block and designated myself secretary, writing down and interpreting whatever came through. In a way, the board was great. We could all indulge our ghost hunting curiosity without having to leave the house. We had all sorts of interesting things come through, and at first they seemed harmless. But before long, things took a frightening turn. I started to become uncomfortable with the whole Ouija thing. I'm not sure why. I wasn't one to discourage everybody else, so I kept my concerns to myself. Even when my friends were saying they'd been repeatedly contacted by evil spirits, I kept my mouth shut. I'm a firm believer in ghosts and always have been, but I didn't think they could cause any harm. Brandon and some of the others started saying they'd made contact several times through the Ouija board with Q, who they were convinced was not only evil, but possibly demonic. Q supposedly said some very threatening things and made everyone present uncomfortable for reasons no one could quite articulate. There just seemed to be a general feeling of dread whenever Q would start talking. I was never present for any of this and absolutely did not take it seriously. I'm a little ashamed to admit I thought it was one of our friends messing with everybody by manipulating the board. As time went on, fewer and fewer of our group were willing to participate in the Ouija sessions, and Brandon's board soon fell into disuse. 
Shortly thereafter, he joined the military and went off to basic training, leaving the Ouija board with the rest of his stuff in his bedroom at his parents' home. Months later, Brandon ended up getting stationed right back in our hometown and moved back in with his parents. One night, I invited him and several more friends down to my dad's place for a few drinks around a bonfire, and Brandon called me asking if I would mind if he brought the Ouija board along to burn. I asked why, and he said he'd been hearing things in his bedroom, having weird dreams, even thinking he'd seen some things he just couldn't write off. His parents had even mentioned some strange things that had concerned him, and he had become more and more convinced that the Ouija board was the problem. None of this had happened before he'd brought it home and used it to speak to the malevolent Q. I hadn't thought about Q in months, and even then wasn't afraid of him. I still thought he was the product of overactive imaginations and maybe some mind-altering substances. And even if he was real, I was absolutely convinced he couldn't cause anyone harm. But I figured, if it would make my buddy feel better, there was no harm in it. So I told Brandon to go ahead and bring the board with him. When he showed up, a few of our more skeptical friends had already arrived, and he told me he wanted to wait until they left to burn the board. I guess he was a little embarrassed by the whole thing. I told him that was fine and stashed it in my bedroom, figuring I would get it out once the skeptics were gone. As it happens, the fate had other plans. My girlfriend at the time, Jess, had entirely too much to drink and required my undivided attention. And Brandon had quit as well, so by the time we all went to bed, the board was still in its box, lying forgotten on my bedroom floor in the corner underneath a table. The next morning brought hangovers all around, and, on my part at least, our previous night's mission was forgotten. I didn't stay at my father's place every night, mostly because it's a bit farther away from civilization than my mother, and I was free to crash wherever I wanted. And so it happened that a week or so after the bonfire, Jess and I found ourselves back in my dad's house for the evening. I was in the habit of falling asleep with the TV on, which Jess could not abide, so we compromised by letting her sleep facing the wall while I slept on the outside of the bed, much closer to the TV so I could have a little volume. And this particular evening, though, she was having trouble getting to sleep and asked me to turn it off. A little annoyed, I complied and started to doze off myself. A few minutes later, Jess made a comment that it was too dark in the bedroom. I told her she was imagining things and to try to get some sleep. In reality, I knew exactly what she was talking about and was praying she would let it go because I didn't have an explanation and was starting to get a little creeped out too. I don't know how to describe it except to say that the whole room seemed like it had had the brightness turned down. The shadows were deeper than normal. The light from the window didn't seem to penetrate as well as it should have. And somehow, the darkness seemed to be emanating from the corner of the room. I couldn't explain it, I didn't understand it, and I certainly didn't like it. But I was adopting the mindset that if I ignored it, everything would be alright. It wasn't the first time something creepy had happened in my dad's house, and it had always amounted to nothing. Jess seemed to take my word for it and soon fell asleep. I turned my back to the darkness, I've always been a side sleeper, and drifted off right behind her. I don't know how long I was asleep exactly, but I awoke with a start, and several things were wrong. The first was that I was on my back, and as I just mentioned, I sleep exclusively on my side. The second was that the darkness had deepened to the point that the room was darker than I would have thought possible, as if the windows had not just the blinds closed, but had been sealed up entirely. The third was the horrifying vision staring down at me from perhaps two feet above me. The encounter couldn't have lasted more than half a second, but as many who have been in life or death situations can tell you, time has a funny way of slowing down in moments of abject terror. One result of this is that the face had been burned indelibly into my mind, though to this day I lack the words to adequately describe it. It was smooth, impossibly smooth, unblemished by any wrinkles whatsoever. It had no eyes, but I have no doubt that it was staring into mine, just the same. Instead, where its eyes should have been were great, 
gaping holes, voids that I could feel beckoning me. Its mouth was impossibly wide, wider than any earthly physiology would allow, stretching all the way from one side of the head to the other. And it was grinning. It had a rictus grin that reminds me now of the Cheshire Cat from Shell. Wide, malicious, and full of impossibly sharp, perfectly interlocking teeth. This is what was leering over me as it snapped open that summer night. And even now, years later, just typing this out has my heart pounding. I was vaguely aware of a body that had to be at least seven feet tall because it was standing on the floor and leaning over my bed, its head still much farther above mine than seemed possible for an average human man. But the face is the only thing that sticks out in my mind. The face and the teeth. Especially the teeth. I was awake instantly. No lingering fatigue plagued my mind, and from that moment I registered what I was seeing, and I reacted instinctively. I screamed, a cry of abject terror that expelled every ounce of air from my lungs. My left arm shot up, seeking to grasp this thing by the throat, and in one fluid motion, I sat up, flipped over, and tried to slam it into the bed. By the time my hand connected with the mattress, I realized I had missed, and when I looked back, the thing was gone. The darkness fast receding, but not fast enough to make me doubt what I had seen. Jess woke up with a start, asking what the heck was going on. It was several minutes before I could answer. I had gone from dead sleep to hyperventilating in an instant, and I was desperately trying to tell myself I hadn't seen what I thought I'd seen. Trying to no avail. When I finally composed myself enough to explain, I had time to look around the room and realize that in the corner from which the earlier darkness emanated was Brandon's Ouija board, the conduit to Q. That was it for my sleep for that night. I told Jess what had happened, mostly, but told it was just a nightmare. I wasn't ready to talk about it yet and wouldn't be for some time. I took the board out to my car and locked it in the trunk. I wasn't ready to deal with it now, but I knew I needed it out of the house. The next morning, I took Jess home, tossed the box and planchette into the fire pit, doused it liberally with gasoline, said a prayer, and lit it up. The box and various branches in the pit caught immediately, but I swear the board itself took several minutes before the flames finally took it. It taunted me in those last moments. I can't explain it any other way. I'm happy to say that I never saw Q again after that. Never felt the darkness deepen that way in my room or any other. The experience didn't scare me off of ghost hunting. I went on to get some pretty incredible EVP and amass a few more fantastic stories. My encounter with Q, however, I usually keep to myself unless I have to warn someone off of meddling in things they don't understand. I will never in my life touch another Ouija board. I've had enough nightmares for a lifetime. John, submitted by user Samantha. Just a bit of a backstory. My mom is English and didn't move to America until she and my dad married when they were 21. When she was 16 and still living in England, there was one particular night that scared the mess out of her. My grandmother, my mom's mom, had been at a friend's house that night and played with the Ouija board. My grandmother says they came in contact with a ghost who said his name was John, that he was eight years old and that he died in a fire. My grandmother was so thoroughly freaked out that she ran all the way home and had a fit in the living room with my granddad. Fast forward about 15 years. I'm a little girl, around two or so. When I start talking about an invisible friend named Shadow, Shadow goes everywhere with us. One time, he travels to England on a family trip. My mom says she was never really scared of me talking to something named Shadow, but it was spooky when I would do things like randomly stop playing in the garden, look up at the window and wave, as if Shadow had called out to me and said hello. Mom said I spent ages sitting in my crib, talking to the corners of my room, as if someone was there, carrying on whole conversations. 
Shadow was my BFF for years. And when I was about four or five, my mom randomly asked me why I called him Shadow and how I came up with the name. Because that's what he looks like. What do you mean? She asked. I mean, he's all shadowy, I said. Oh, so you call him Shadow. Yeah, but his real name is John. He died in a fire when he was eight. That's why he's all shadowy. Steven, submitted by user Randy Linus. One summer, my college roommate and I got obsessed playing with the Ouija board she brought home. I had never had one because my mother was very, very superstitious. I made up for lost time asking the board everything from what kind of drink I should have, what takeout. I even took the fall semester class list and asked what I should take. Usually, the answers were easily attributed to our state of mind and cravings. But every once in a while, we get some very strange answers. Or rather, I would. Does my boyfriend love me? No. Is he cheating on me? Yes. Will I ever get married? Never. Will I have children? Dead. So on and so forth. Of course, I accused my roomie of working out some passive-aggressive overflow, which she denied, so we decided to get to the bottom of it. Are you a relative? Yes. Of Astrid's? No. On my mom's side or dad's side? No. Are you evil? Very. Can you make things happen? Already have. After a couple of conversations that went pretty much the same way, we stowed the board and didn't give it a second thought. But we did ask one final question. What is your name? Stephen. Flash forward about three years. I'm in a car with my mom, one of my little sisters and her friend, right around Halloween time. Somehow the conversation turned to Ouija boards. My sister is trying to challenge my mom on the silly ban so I decided to share the story. When I get to the final part, the identity of the entity, my mother gasps and pulls to the side of the road. It took at least a full minute before she was calm enough to talk. Stephen was the name of my biological father's father. According to my mother, he absolutely hated her, had discouraged the marriage, disinherited my father when she got pregnant, and challenged her on paternity and he died in the same hospital I was born in, three hours before my birth. His last words to my father were, now you'll have to live with your mistakes forever. They divorced when I was 18 months old and I had never known any of the history. Mimi, submitted by user K Corda. A few years after my grandmother, who we called Mimi, passed away, my sister and I, 14 and 20 respectively, were sitting on the front porch in the middle of the day with the Ouija board. We didn't normally do this kind of thing and we were really just messing around with no expectations. We started by asking a few questions if anyone was there who wanted to talk. We got a few yeses and a lot of nonsense. We started to get bored, but asked one more time. Another yes to ask if there was anyone there. We asked the name and the reply was Dorothy. Not knowing anyone named Dorothy, we asked if she had a last name. She spelled out my sister's and my last name. We thought it was a bunch of BS and decided on one last question before we stopped playing. We asked if she had anything she wanted to tell us. Yes, Mimi loves and misses you. Still being a sore spot, it kind of unnerved us. We quit playing and didn't mention it again. Last week, I asked my father if he knew of anyone named Dorothy with her last name. His response? Yeah, she's your great aunt. Only you didn't know her by Dorothy. She went by her middle name. It's Aunt Louise. We never touched the Ouija board again, and my sister and I never spoke of it either. The Middle Room, submitted by Nevermore. 
Last year, my husband and I moved into a very old brownstone in Philadelphia. The house was built in 1860 and is now divided into six apartments. Ours is an Edgar Allan Poe story come to life. I was immediately drawn to its 14-foot ceilings with intricate molding and wood floors, fireplaces, tiny carved wooden treasures everywhere, like eagles and faces in hidden spots, and what I refer to as middle room, an octagonal room with a floor made of elaborate wood tiles and enclosed with dark blood red wood walls. The way the apartment is laid out, you enter into the big living room, dining room, kitchen, walk through the next room, middle room, to get to the bedroom. The three rooms are separated by large, heavy wooden doors that slide out from the middle when you pull on those gold-plated curving handlebar things. The door that separates middle room from our bedroom have glass windows on either side. So at night, we can see into it from the bed. We use it as an office and I've turned a wall of glass cabinets into a bookshelf. There is a perch, like a wooden plank diving board, over the bookshelf, just jutting out. Probably at some time meant for a plant. I put a fake black raven there to watch over the books, because why not? I have been interested in supernatural and scary things, especially haunted houses. So when we moved in, I was fully expecting some action. I researched the original owners, he was a prominent doctor, explored the remnants of the servants' quarters in the basements. I even spoke to the apartment like it was human. Now, to be honest, I actually don't 100% believe in ghosts or things like that. I just love history and hope that there is something else out there. I'm like a 57% believer. As a child, I did have a chronic vision that would come to me when I lay down to go to sleep. Before falling asleep, I would see a bride and groom slowly walking towards the foot of my bed. When I closed my eyes, they would go away. This happened for years on and off, and I never told anyone. That experience was enough to make me believe in ghosts. But generally, I'm a pretty science-based person who thinks mediums and psychics are fun, but mostly baloney. My dad, on the other hand, is a true believer and always has been. He's a realtor and has had a lot of pushing, paper-tugging experiences in homes he was about to sell. He's the kind of person who won't visit historic sites like old prisons because he doesn't want to bring ghosts back with him. One weekend, he visited us in Philadelphia, and things got weird. He was not staying with us, but at a nearby hotel. One night, he came over for dinner, and I was showing him one of the 14-foot wooden closets whose doors heavily swung open to reveal shelves and shelves of random items, including our Ouija board. Yes, I had gone there. Soon after our move, some friends and I tried it out for fun. Nothing really came out of it except a bunch of, we're happy you're here messages, kind of like you would get on a tent card on a desk at the Holiday Inn. I had shoved a Ouija board into the closet and forgotten about it. My father, on the other hand, was immediately upset. He gave me the usual scoldings not to mess around with these things, that they can do harm and wake things up. His last words on the matter were, one of these days you'll hear them knocking. Fast forward to the following morning. My husband, George, was in the living room while I was in bed. Suddenly, I hear the large wooden doors pull open, and George asks if everything is okay. I said yes, I had just woken up. Then he asked, why was I knocking? George had not heard the conversation with my dad. Apparently, the knocking was coming from the middle room. He said it was urgent and loud. I had heard nothing and certainly done nothing. We kind of shrugged it off and laughed when I told him about what my dad had said. The following morning, it's 5.23 a.m. I am woken up by the loudest knocking coming from the middle room. I remain frozen, paralyzed in bed. I can see into the middle room, specifically the glass bookshelf and the black raven. The knock is exactly like something you would hear on a door probably six intense, evenly spaced knocks. 
It is absolutely not the sound of anything settling or falling. It is absolutely not coming from outside or from our neighbors. There was one below us and one upstairs who were out of town. And even if they were home, the sound was definitely coming from inside our apartment, like six feet away from me. For the first time since the bride and groom waltzed their way towards me, I was scared. So scared that I woke up George just so he could walk me to the bathroom. Since that morning, there have been random noises here and there, but nothing like those knocks. But I now have a greater appreciation for the apartment and for my dad's intuition, or whatever you want to call it. When I googled, it told me that many people believe supernatural knocking indicates pending death. So that was awesome. So far, we're all here, knock on wood, pun intended. And yes, I did think that maybe it was a practical joke played on me by my father, but the logistics of this were impossible. He was nowhere near our apartment building, didn't have a key, and would never do that anyway. George slept through the second knocking, so I know it wasn't him. A few weeks later, I opened the closet and couldn't see the Ouija board where it had been left. It definitely could have fallen among the other crap and been obscured, but I haven't investigated further. Auto, submitted by user Luminatrix. I don't mess with Ouija boards, never have, never will, for two reasons. One, if they are bunk and it's people moving the thing, even subconsciously, why waste the time? Two, if it isn't bunk and you really are tapping into something beyond what we understand, that just seems like it isn't something eight-year-olds and drunk college students should be tempting without any kind of training or knowledge. My story goes a long way to confirming number two for me. In the 70s, my uncle had two friends, a couple, that were into these occult spiritualism type of things. They loved communicating with the dead and had a regular ghost named Otto they talked to a lot. One night, they convinced my uncle to give it a go. They didn't have a traditional Ouija board. They just laid out scrabble tiles on the dining room table and used a glass on the planchette. So things get started and the glass is moving around and my uncle thinks it's cool and seems real enough. He certainly isn't moving the planchette, but it feels off, very off and wrong at the same time. The glass is being very jerky and the couple is saying it doesn't seem like auto this time. So my uncle pulls his hands off and says he doesn't want to do this anymore. The couple agrees that it was really weird and way more negative feeling than usual. They convince him to give it one more go using an old communion chalice they had bought in an antique store, and he very reluctantly agrees. This time it's very different, very light and warm. The cup starts flying, spelling out words so fast the person writing them down can barely keep up. It spells, leave the dead alone. What they know is not for you to know. They all freak out a bit, but this is a much friendlier feeling, and they ask, who is this? It spells out, Saint Gerard. The cup then shudders to a stop and doesn't move again. So the next day, my uncle goes to the library because he had never heard of a Saint Gerard. And sure enough, there it is. Saint Gerard Magella, patron saint of unborn children and expecting mothers. This was way more than enough for him to never, ever try this kind of thing again. And it's enough for me to confirm my already gut instinct about these things. The Summoning, submitted by user Green Halls. When I was 13, my friends and I decided it would be fun to use a Ouija board because we were rebellious geniuses. The old secluded farmhouse we were staying at doubled as my friend's parents' business. Hospice house on the first floor, family residence on the second. 
I don't remember much about actually interacting with the board, but looking back, it was directly preceding the most terrifying events of my life. A week or two later, three of us were sleeping in the same house, sharing one bed. One of my friends woke up and saw a figure that she assumed was friend number two standing over me in what she described as a hoodie with a hood drawn over her face. So the faceless hooded figure was standing over the bed. My friend said that the figure was just staring down at me. It was only when she felt my other friend lying next to her that she screamed and woke us up. About a month later, my friend is convinced something is haunting her and proceeds to buy purifying candles and the like. She believes her room is now cleansed. Up until this point, I haven't experienced anything until one night while I was attempting to meditate. Being 13, I didn't have any proper form of meditation or protections against opening myself up spiritually. I was meditating at night with candles burning, listening to music. It was winter and there were two feet of snow outside. Something startled me and drew my attention to the window. When I opened my eyes, I saw a hunched, mangled black shadow move past my window. I was very freaked out, but tried to find an explanation. Maybe a family member had thrown the shadow. Maybe I had imagined it. I figured that in the morning, I could just look at the pure, untouched snow and know it wasn't real. If only that were the case. In the morning, I found the most terrifying, bizarre tracks across my front yard. They started like human footsteps, then somehow morphed into a large, four-legged creature similar to a deer or a dog, then smaller, like a rabbit. Then they disappeared. Additionally, words were written in the snow on our porch, but the wind had obscured them too much to read. My dad tried to convince me that it was probably a prank and the animals could have backtracked in each other's steps. I joked for years about the snow chupacabra, and I would now consider myself a skeptical person. But what followed these stories was years of the worst depression and fear of the unknown. I moved away and things got better. Luckily, I can say I don't feel haunted anymore so long as I don't visit home. The Fraternity, submitted by user Oz Jesting. In 1986, I attended one semester of college in Marshall in Missouri. Go Vikings. Small town, small population, but a lot of big fun. The school had three dorm facilities for general students, and there was also three fraternity houses. As the school was Christian aligned, the dorms had very strict rules, such as no alcohol, no opposite sex in room after nine, curfews, etc. The frat house did not have such rules. So while I don't subscribe to the frat ideal, I convinced a bunch of my fellow theater types to join me in one of the houses to have better living arrangements. I'm not sure the football team, traditional keepers of the house, were thrilled to see us arrive, but we did win the skit competition handily during Greek week. One of the general dorm buildings was three stories tall but the third floor had been closed for ages. There was a story floating around about a student named Steven who had died in his room on the third floor. But this was just a sad fact. It happened so long ago that the few teachers who remembered it seemed to think it was just natural causes of some sort. It wasn't in any way a campus ghost story at all. The fact that the floor was closed was also a coincidence, just a bad repair. It remained open for years after the death. The Halloween week rolls around. One of the theater boys, Bobby, thinks it would be fun to do a seance with the Ouija board Halloween night. So about half the fraternity jams into Bobby's room around 10 p.m. It was a small room, a typical double bunk box, but now stuffed with about 15 of us. Most football players. It was drunken, rowdy, and had all the classic jibes and catcalls you would expect from young men in this scene. We turned off the lights, had a few candles around for atmosphere. Dave, the punter, was on Ouija board with Bobby. The mucky round settles as Dave starts a beautiful monotone delivery that was very hypnotic. 
A bunch of cartoon-style Halloween invocations are made. The dowel on the board is pushed around, but nobody is really sure what is supposed to be happening. We're about to call it a night when one of the guys suddenly says, Hey, why don't you two try and make contact with Stephen? Dave agrees and begins once again with the intonation, but the focus now makes everything suddenly seem more eerie. Stephen, join us in the room, Stephen. We want to contact Stephen. Step through the veil, Stephen. Suddenly, the dial flips off the board and clatters to the floor, startling the room. Dave bends to retrieve it. When he sits back up with the dial, a shrill gasp escapes his mouth as he sees Bobby. Bobby's now slumped forward, head on chest, gurgling. A guttural sound pushes through spittle and much lolling of his mouth. Half the room is suddenly terrified, the other half skittishly joking about Bobby faking it. Dave starts asking questions. Are you Stephen? Tell us what happened, Stephen, and so on. Bobby never says anything intelligible, just groans, quiet murmurs, and a lot of nose and mouth snot oozing and flapping around. This lasts maybe three to five minutes. Finally, our running back freaks out, leaps off the bed, snaps on the light, and rushes out of the room. Bobby suddenly sits up straight, and in a very confused voice, asks what is happening. He says he doesn't remember a thing. In his version of the story, the doll had just hit the floor, and suddenly, Jason was running out of the room. Dave quizzed him. We all tried to get him to admit he was just faking us out. But he seemed terribly confused, adamant that it had not happened. He wanted to know what prank we were playing on him. That was that. We dispersed. Many of the team wouldn't hang with Bobby for weeks. Bobby never understood why he was treated with spooky concern. What do I think? It was weird. Bobby was a terrible actor, so I don't really think he had the chops to do what I saw. He was also terribly vain. Had he pranked, I would have expected grandiose dialogue from the possession. And certainly not a bucket of mucus all over his shirt. I also would have expected him to eventually come clean, just to show us how good he was to fool us all. But it never happened. And that's all for this episode. What about you? Have you ever used a Ouija board? If so, I'd love to hear about your experience. I also have a video on my YouTube channel from last year that features two other Ouija board stories. You can find the link for that in the show notes. In the next episode, I'll be covering stories from the UK, a place notorious for its history and hauntings. Until then, please remember to share the podcast with your paranormally inclined friends and family. And I hope all you ghouls and ghosts stay safe.